Welcome to episode 79 of Talking Dairy. I'm your host, Jack McGowan. In today's podcast, we are talking with Dairy NZ Senior Science Manager, Aslan Wrightstow, about progress the sector has made on actions to improve water quality. We'll be discussing commitments made by the sector, the progress farmers have made, what environmental responses we're seeing, and the science we're working on to improve effectiveness. Kia ora Aslan, welcome to Talking Dairy. Let's start by hearing a bit about you. What's your background and how did you come to be working in water quality science? Kia ora Jack and uh, thanks for having me. So my background is going way, way back, uh, growing up on the banks of the Hiranui River down here in Canterbury. So the informative years of my life were spent skimming stones and, and rafting down down the river. And I think that kind of, no pun intended, planted a, a little bit of a seed in terms of an interest in water quality and an interest in environmental science. And so, yeah, one, one thing led to another. And before I know it, I'm at New University and I finished my undergrad and I didn't know what to do after that. And so I did postgrad. And when I finished my postgrad, I knew that I didn't want to study anymore. But water quality uh, and environmental science was where I'd ended up there. So from there, a roll into Niwa, and I had a blast. So, yeah, all of those things coming together and um, had a, a farming background as well, again, through informative years. And so I guess the nexus or the combination of those two things is, has brought me into having a, a pretty significant interest in a, in a career really associated with water quality, land use, land use impacts, mitigation options, improving outcomes. Wonderful. Thanks, Aslan. Can you provide us an overview about your role here at DairyNZ and the work that you and your team lead? So my role is science manager, and I'm based down in Lincoln. I manage a, a team of scientists whose role covers quite a broad spectrum of work, really. It's around reducing environmental footprint. It's around climate change resilience, and it's around increasing forage gains. So collectively across those three areas, quite a wide diversity of work. Well, the sector has achieved great progress on efforts to improve healthy waterways. Aslan, talk us through these key milestones and how did they come about? Yeah, there's a, a long and I would say significant track record of work done by farmers in response to environmental pressures. And the reality is a, a big chunk of that is, is around social licence and the importance of, of getting that part right. But more broadly, it's about doing the right thing and, and a commitment to environmental stewardship. And farmers, are, I think, innately respond to that and, and live in that space. In terms of sector-wide commitments, I guess the most significant and, and, and probably starting point for that was the Clean Streams Water Record. That started in 2003 and, and really that, that was a commitment to stock exclusion, to effluent compliance, to nutrient management, to getting the basics right and doing that. And so that Clean Streams Water Record ran through to 2013, so for a decade, and then it was superseded by the Sustainable Dairy Water Record in 2013. And, and really that one was around wider adoption. It was around pushing implementation, riparian management plans, professional training services to support farmers. So basically bringing those two things together, a commitment to what we call good farming practice. It's doing the right things. It's getting the, the basics right. And that's where you hear that farmers and dairy farmers have stock excluded 98% of accord waterways. So waterways greater than a metre wide and 30 centimetres deep. 25,000 kilometres, in fact, 10,000 nutrient plans. So those sorts of large scale commitment and followed through with large-scale implementation, really around raising that standard, raising that bar, improving environmental performance through doing the basics and getting those basics really spot on. How do farmers kind of, you know, when they start doing the basics, for example, when a Clean Streams Accord came in, we needed to exclude stock. How does their behaviour change as a result of making that basic first step? A big part of it is about understanding the why. As a farmer, why am I being asked to do this? I had a, um, a beer recently with a Taranaki dairy farmer, and we were just talking about the riparian program that has rolled out in that region. It's been incredibly successful. 
And he said, he's, he's been through that whole process. And I just said to him, well, you know what, from your perspective, looking back, what made that work? What, why was that successful? And he said, there were a couple of reasons. First one was there was investment in understanding the why. And so the advice through to farmers, uh, particularly through the Taranaki Regional Councils and their land management advisors, was to bring farmers on that journey by understanding the reason why. So, so that was number one. Number two was access to discounted plants. So that just made it a little bit easier. You understand the why, you've still got a vested interest, but it makes it easier. The whole thing was was easier. Planning, planting, there was strong support for that. And the third one is that it was separated from regulation. It was understanding the why and it was having the support to drive that. Since the Accords, the dairy sector has continued to improve its environmental performance and further committed to action to improve the health of waterways. Can you share what these commitments were and also their current progress? I mentioned before the Clean Streams Accord, that was a start. The Sustainable Dairy Water Accord brought the bar a little bit higher. That came to a natural end in around about 2017, and that was superseded by a broad dairy sector commitment across a number of metrics. And what are the outcomes we're seeking to achieve here? And so moving away away from a one-size-fits-all approach to what can I do or what should a particular farm do to drive the best outcomes for water quality and and more broadly environmental outcomes based on where that farm is and based on the issues for that particular catchment or that particular location. So so bringing that stuff together, um, farm environment plans became quite obvious quite quickly in terms of a central and, and key, playing a key role in being a mechanism to deliver on that. So... The commitment moved to all farmers having a farm environment plan by 2025. I talked a little bit about good farming practice and, again, getting the basics right but lifting that expectation while we're doing that. So so the second component of that commitment was around what we call good farming practice status. And so that was just understanding what should every farmer be doing. Let's raise that up and kind of increase the ambition and we'll monitor and, and report on that. So that was the third part. Nutrient use, uh, nutrient targets, we couldn't move away from that. We're the dairy sector and so nutri- uh, nitrogen sits central to um, a lot of what we do, although we're moving away from that narrative a little bit. So we had some stuff around purchase nitrogen surplus, removing the surplus from the system, and also uh, Olsen P, and, and so having an agronomic soil optimum for phosphorus. We also had stuff around measuring and managing greenhouse gas emissions. But collectively, it was then around that building on that good farming practice in the right location, so right place, right time, right location for actions. In terms of progress, we're making really great progress across those you know, after that commitment in 2017. So as of December last year, December 2023, 80% of dairy farmers have a freshwater farm plan. 62% have a greenhouse gas plan, a greenhouse gas farm plan. 96% of dairy farmers received an emissions, a greenhouse gas emissions report, so understanding where those emissions are coming from. And 95% of farmers received a purchased nitrogen surplus report as well. On the latter, and coming back to the, the nutrient side of things, when we were thinking about these commitments, and in particular thinking about that nutrient component of that, the conversation went, well, yeah, it's, it's great. We, we want to know purchased nitrogen surplus. So that difference between nitrogen in through feed and fert, for example, and out through milk and meat and crops, that surplus. So from there, it was, okay, well, let's, let's set up a, a target to try and reduce some of that surplus. And so we did that. And we've now got a, a benchmark target, and it's based on a 75% oil. But what is important on that is of that target, so bringing that surplus out of the system and bringing that surplus back to a certain level, 86% of farmers are now sitting below that target already. So made great progress in reducing that, that surplus um, from the system. So all in all, really positive progress. And, and, and that again, it builds off that clean streams and that sustainable dairy and it's that ongoing commitment to change and it's change at scale. And that's what drives improvements and outcomes. 
we all know water quality is an ongoing journey. You've been talking about that journey already. And the science is complex. What does the science tell us on the link between farmer action and water quality improvement? The caveat here is it's complex. And I've talked a little bit about that moving away from a one-size-fits-all approach and moving to right action, right place, right time. And so for a particular catchment, and and the reason for that is that complexity of catchments and and whether that be in soil type or climate or rainfall or slope, all of those things vary throughout the country. But also in, in terms of the makeup of the catchment, the land use within that, and also in terms of the receiving environment and, and whether we've got a, a sensitive receiving environment sitting at the bottom. So, so a lake, for example. So all of those things make for understanding and assessing the outcomes to the environmental state, in this particular case, to water quality, based on the actions taken across a complex system. That stuff is, is tricky and it's challenging. We've got great people working on it, though. What's exciting for the team in this space is that the data that we're now collecting through the Sustainable Dairy Water Accord, through the other environmental and sector commitments, is putting us in a stronger and stronger position to be able to test and understand what are the responses. So there was a a nice piece of collaborative work uh, Dairy NZ did with our land water and ag research a couple of years ago that found that between 95 and 2015, without the actions that farmers had taken, we would have 45% more nitrogen, 98% more phosphorus in the system. So significant in terms of that response. In terms of building on that, I talked about that commitment to right action, right place, proven actions implemented at scale via a farm plan. The science suggests that there's still probably enough between 20 and 35% more gains in reduction of nitrogen and between 25 and 35% more gains in reduction of phosphorus through implementation. So that the science supporting the reason for having what I coined and talked about good farming practice status, understanding that, raising that bar. That's the reason that we're doing that because it's, it's that proven actions and it's that confidence. There's a, another piece of work that we published last year year, we referred to as best practice dairy catchments. And and what that looked at was a range of dairy dominated catchments, right? If you've got a catchment with lots of different land uses in, it's very hard to say the actions from this particular sector within a complex catchment result in these particular outcomes. We chose that work and again, collaborative piece of work across a a number of stakeholders, including Newer Dairy and Z, regional councils, ag research and ourselves, honed in on catchments that had a very high proportion of dairy. So so that just removes a little bit of those confounding factors and, and a little bit of that complexity if you can just come back to catchments that have been dominated by dairy. What that work has found, published last year, is that 70% of water quality trends were improving over a 20-year period for ammonium, for dissolved reactive phosphorus, for total phosphorus, for E. coli, for sediment. So really nice outcomes there with respect to water quality improvements. In that example, nitrogen wasn't improving. And there are multiple reasons for that, including over that 20-year period, uh, intensification. We saw that play out across all of those catchments. Now, in saying that, what we are doing, there's quite an intentional move going forward. It, It folds into our new strategy. We're moving to increasingly focus on healthy waterways. So as opposed to nitrogen, as opposed to phosphorus specifically, it's the outcomes that we're looking for. Yes, in some cases, nitrogen or phosphorus will impact those outcomes, but not always. And there's there's a whole range of other factors, including habitat and, and shade and water temperature that affect the fish that live in streams and rivers and affect the macroinvertebrates, affect the, um, the macrophytes uh, and algae. They're the more important outcomes that we're looking for from a water quality perspective. The new strategy and the the new work that we're doing there is really around prioritising that. Our science programs are really gearing up in terms of what are the key drivers for improving healthy waterways, ecosystem health. 
those outcomes in terms of fish and macroinvertebrates and aquatic plants and algae. So how can farmers access the new science and the research on water quality that Dairy NZ is rolling out for them? There's the usual suite via um, podcast <laughs> and via online resources, uh, via the web. I talked about farm plans before as, as being, you know, a key component to support the management for outcomes. And there's a nice opportunity for us to have the science that we do, the science that gets done across New Zealand and can internationally, brought through into the hands of a farmer via their farm plan. And so we've done quite a lot of thinking about this and it works on a number of fronts. We've worked collaboratively with our land and water to develop a tool. Um, It's not overly visible at the moment, but it is easily accessible by a farm plan, by a dairy company. And we have done that very, very intentionally because we've committed to all farmers having a farm plan by 2025. That's a natural alignment. So we've called it Farm Act, so Farm Action Prioritisation Tool is a piece of work that basically brings the last three decades of science into a farm plan. And it does that in a geospatial way. So it starts with a map. It's a map and it's a farm boundary. So that's your starting point. And what that does is that it immediately brings through layers. You don't see this, but it brings up layers that highlight what we call a typology. So key biophysical factors that influence contaminant loss to waterways. So the slope and the rainfall and the climate, the soil type, like they're key factors that influence. So you've got a map, you've got your farm boundary, you now got your, your key factors that are known to influence contaminant loss. The tool goes one step further and it links through to your nearest downstream water quality monitoring station. Those three things in combination are a really powerful tool to help support farmers to understand what are the actions that are going to be most effective. And if I'm investing my money and my time in work on farm, I want to know I'm going with those actions that are going to be most effective or going to be most cost effective. So the tool via an API goes through into the farm environment plan, brings up a long list of actions appropriate for reducing contaminants, and it does that in a way that prioritises those actions based on the particular location of the farm, based on those biophysicals, and based on the most pressing water quality issue for that particular catchment. There's so many people working on this stuff, and it's complex, and it's all mixed. And so how do you access that information in a way that's relevant for me and my particular farm? That's a nice way that we're bringing Dairy NZ science, our collaborative work programs through into the hands of farmers. Well, you may have lost some of us with words like API, but also not all of us love to, you know, write plans and work on the web. For people who are like that, who like to work more in person or or verbally, what kind of support is there for them to create a farm environment plan and to get the, the value of farm apt? In the first instance, it's around working with your dairy company and looking at the way our new strategy is rolling out. It's been quite deliberate in increasing that focus on partnership. And a big part of that partnership component is mechanisms for taking our expertise and our science and bringing that through into those people who are working more one-to-one with farmers. And dairy companies have a much stronger role. They play a much stronger role in that part. The second one, and it's it's been around for a long time in the catchment group space, and increasingly there's a lot of momentum, there's a lot of energy and increasing amounts of expertise to support catchment groups. And so, again, through the new strategy and new work programs that we've got going on, there's a lot of thought going into at the moment. How do we bring our expertise and put that into the hands of those that are coordinating and facilitating those groups? So it's a challenging space because the team that we have here at DRNZ is relatively small. There's 10,500 dairy farms, and so we need to scale that up. Catchment groups give an opportunity to do that by bringing that information through into those groups and their facilitators. 
you've mentioned a couple of times, new strategy for Dairy NZ. So Dairy NZ's adapting its operating model and moving towards a farm systems approach in how we work with farmers. What does this mean for farmers looking to improve water quality within their catchments? I think it sits quite naturally and quite fundamentally in the space that we're working in to improve water quality. There's a whole lot of stuff that we do around, I guess what we call edge of field mitigations. That's about reducing contaminants before they reach a waterway. There is by and far a much larger opportunity and greater opportunity to stop that flow of contaminant through to the waterways through farm systems. And so I've talked quite a lot today about good farming practice and really the majority of actions that sit in that good farming practice category relate to um, farm systems. It's building on that and it's bringing that stuff, that farm systems expertise and knowledge. And, and Dairy NZ, you know, excels in that space. It's continuing to raise the bar and continuing to provide that guidance and expertise and it's building confidence that the, those actions are going to make a difference. There's a lot of effort that goes into that, but really that's that's what we're trying to achieve. Confidence in those actions and those actions are implemented at scale. We can measure that as that data set grows and I talked about that data set getting bigger and bigger. We can do better and better in science and, and that's a really you know a continuous improvement cycle so the farm systems in the new strategy it's around developing targeted solutions right actions right place the farm systems information that extending the amount of data that we've got and that to provide insights and analytics and ultimately give confidence and science plays a, a critical role in that 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 confidence empowers farmers to make decisions and drive action on farm you talked about the benefits of shade for water temperature how much shading is required to get that impact and what is the impact do we know how much cooler it is yeah, there's a, a dendritic nature of a, a stream network, which basically means small waterways turn into bigger waterways. Those bigger waterways do when they turn into big, bigger waterways. The impacts on water temperature can be very challenging to determine on a particular reach at a particular location in a particular catchment. It depends on all sorts of factors in terms of stream length, size, volume of water, the temperature of water coming out of, for example, a native forest at the top and moving down. However, we, we do know you flip that the opposite way. And I, I did quite a lot of work in my previous role at, at NEWA looking at the impacts of forest harvest on streams just in general and, and temperature. But you see a step change in, in water temperature as that shade disappears. When you harvest for mature trees, direct sunlight, water temperature can increase. And you start getting water temperatures above early to mid-20 degrees. That starts having impacts on our sensitive species. In terms of reducing the amount of aquatic nuisance plants, so macrophytes and algae, science suggests that around 70% shade is needed to stop that prolific growth of plants and algae. That's useful. It works up to a certain extent, right? As, as waterways get wider and wider, the ability for riparian vegetation to shade them decreases. But generally, in sort of smaller waterways, good opportunities there to reduce the amount of direct sunlight. And when you, you're getting up to that level of around about 70%, then you're starting to see the impacts on the aquatic plants and, and algae. That's important when we come all the way back to what is the outcome that we're looking to achieve. And, and we do have a tendency in New Zealand to focus on nutrients as being the lever to pull on to reduce those important outcomes. It is one of the levers to pull on and, and, and shade in this example is a, is a really great example of how you can use other factors that also have all those co-benefits in terms of the biodiversity and the bank stabilisation and carbon sequestration, all of those things. Uh, really massive opportunity there for those improvements. Okay, lastly, what's your advice for someone who's looking to improve water quality within their local catchment? Firstly, hats off, well done. Secondly, I'd, I'd say understand catchment 
context. That's a, a, an important part. I talked about the role of the farm plan. Farm plan is at the individual farm scale. It goes much broader than that. But understand what are the issues. I've had some interesting conversations with catchment groups. The question that I ask is, what are you looking to achieve? You know, what's the outcome that you're looking to solve here? The response has been to reduce nitrogen. So we're going to put in a constructed wetland and it's going to reduce nitrogen. And then uh, the question is, well, is there any data? Do you have any information on the, the water quality itself? So first thing is understand what is it that you're trying to achieve and, and understanding what levers have you got in order to do that. Secondly, I'd say focus on those outcomes more holistically. Thinking about the fish and the, the habitat and the macroinvertebrates, etc., cetera, those, those key outcomes, and then working backwards from there. It could be fish passage, for example, is a major issue. And so therefore, rather than doing a different action, it might be around thinking about perch culverts, it might be thinking about fish barriers, those sorts of things. The catchment context, understand what you're looking to achieve, what are the, the key outcomes. Get into the data would be my advice understand what we've got there, whether or not there is water quality, whether the, the, there or not there is any habitat data, whether or not there is any macroinvertebrate or fish data. Talk to your council. Council will have, in a lot of cases, will have information. Council will also have access to resource, whether that be funding or in-kind time to support action on ground. Think about collectives. Think about catchment groups and whether they exist in the catchment, joining into one of those, if not establishing one, and building that momentum that that comes with that. So it's not all falling on one person's shoulders. Thank you, Aslan. That brings us to the end of the podcast. Thank you so much for talking with us today. It's always good to pause and celebrate how much progress farmers in the sector have made in protecting and improving the health of waterways. And thank you for giving us some insight to where we're going next, what still needs to be done or what can still be done, and how farmers are being supported to succeed in that space. Mā te wā, no ho oro mai. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Talking Dairy. Check the show notes on where to go for more information on this topic. And if you have any ideas on future episodes, please send an email to talkingdairy at dairynz.co.nz.